The Deep End team acknowledges the traditional owners of the lands on which we work and live, pays respect to elders past, present and future, and recognises the importance of Indigenous knowledge to informing public debate. Our guest today on The Deep End is Anne Toomey. Anne Toomey is Professor Emerita of Constitutional Law at the University of Sydney. She has practised as a solicitor and is admitted to practice in New South Wales, Victoria, the Australian Capital Territory and the High Court of Australia. She has worked for the High Court of Australia, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Research Service, the Commonwealth Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee and the Cabinet Office of New South Wales. She has acted as a consultant to various government bodies and is currently a part-time consultant at Gilbert and Tobin Lawyers. She has authored four books on constitutional law and is a member of the Constitutional Expert Group that has provided advice to the Australian Government on the voice referendum. So Anne, we're uh, really pleased to be able to interview you for our Deep End podcast. We're here on Wurundjeri Bunurong country at the beautiful Ian Potter Centre, which is part of the Melbourne Conservatorium um, here in South Bank. And this is Wurundjeri Bunurong country. So, and it's a great pleasure to interview you today. Uh, Aaron and I are very much looking forward to this. So we'd like to know a little about you, first of all. Uh, I guess the big question is, uh, how did you become a constitutional expert? Um, uh, I think it's because I was quite interested in constitutional law, even as a child, which is an odd thing, really. I think it's more I was interested in politics to begin with. I always knew I never wanted to be a politician um, at all, but I'm interested in the structures of power and the limits that are placed on power. And it's the constitution that is actually the, the source of all power in Australia and the source of all limits on power. So that's the sort of thing I was interested in. I, um, in particular, I remember in my HSC year, I studied a play called A Man for All Seasons, um, a Robert Bolt play, which is about Sir Thomas More. And a lot of that was about the law and the rule of law and justice and all those sorts of things. And I found it really interesting. So from there, it was the constitution that always interested me. And you're quite the expert um, and you've become, I think, the preeminent expert during the referendum debate. Uh, and uh, I'd like to know a, a, a little bit about uh, uh, the great respect that you're held in um, and why your views are so often sought out in relation to the referendum on Indigenous constitutional recognition and the voice? Uh, well, part of it is history. Uh, so Noel Pearson came to me um, with Shireen Morris um, many years ago now, I think it was maybe 2013 or thereabouts, uh, to raise with me issues about how um, Indigenous people could respond to the difficulties they'd had in getting government to um, accept an earlier expert panel report about um, constitutional recognition. And so that was the point I became particularly involved in the formation of the, the idea of the voice, helping with the drafting and those sorts of things. So I, I do have a history um, of involvement in it. Uh, but from a constitutional point of view, I've been um, involved in constitutional law for a long time. So I can trace that back to, I worked in the High Court um, during the 1990s, during the Mason Court. I actually was a researcher for the court and worked on the Mabo decision, uh, which I guess was my, my first involvement um, in Indigenous affairs. So I, I helped the judges with research and the background of the um, Mabo decision. And then I worked in the Commonwealth Parliament when the Native Title Act was being passed. And I was in the research service there and advised politicians on issues concerning native title and um, and the like. Um, and then I worked later on in the New South Wales government um, at the time of um, the Commonwealth legislation that followed the WIC decision um, in trying to work out then how um, state laws needed to change to be consistent with the Commonwealth law. So I did all of that. So I've got practical experience as a constitutional lawyer working in the 
courts, working in the Commonwealth Parliament, working in the state public service in the Cabinet Office. So I have that practical experience as well as long academic experience in a university as well. And I guess the final point in all of that is I'm one of the very few academics who's prepared to respond to the media. So I do a lot of public education through the media, um, either just answering questions of journalists who just need to understand things. So I do a lot of that and most of that never appears in public, but just explaining things to people, but also through the media, bit through op-ed or talking on radio or television, trying to translate constitutional knowledge um, in a way that's understandable by ordinary human beings so that the people themselves can properly participate in the um, in the um, constitutional system, which I think is most important. Um, the thing that motivates me is that I am a Democrat to the extent that what I mean by that is that I really believe that the people need to fully participate in our electoral system and they need to understand a governmental system. And they need to understand it as well. And from that point of view, I do a lot of work trying to to help in that. Uh, that's a, a very uh, substantial involvement in uh, the key issues uh, that Indigenous people have been very concerned about for some decades. I am curious as to how you would explain to your, you know, run-of-the-mill journalist in the mainstream media, uh, what the constitution presently says about race. How do you explain that to a, well, it doesn't have to be a journalist, anybody who might ask you? Yeah, well, so one of the, the misnomers that's been going around at the moment is people say there's no race in the constitution. Well, well, there is, and there has been since 1901. It's, it's mentioned there twice. The curious thing about it is it's, it's sort of done in opposing ways. Um, so we've got two provisions in there. Um, one, section 25, it's not really effective in these um, these days, but the, the gist of it is it, it, it's in here, it comes from the US Bill of Rights. And um, the gist of it was to say, if you're a state and you exclude people from voting on the basis of race, then we're gonna disadvantage you at the Commonwealth level by reducing your population by the number of people you've excluded from voting so that you get less representation at the Commonwealth level. Now, it's a fairly minor thing, but it is um, an anti-racial discrimination thing. It was intended to um, deter states from removing people's right to vote on the basis of race. So you've got your one anti-racial discrimination provision, section 25, which by the way, I should say people don't like anymore. They want to get rid of it. And the reason they don't like it is because it contemplates the possibility that um, people could be um, have their rights to vote removed on the basis of race. And from that point of view, it's bad. And yes, we should get rid of it. So that's one of them. But the key one is section 5126 of the Constitution. And it says that the Commonwealth Parliament is able to make special laws uh, with respect to people of um, any race uh, for whom it's deemed necessary. And that law was intended always to be racially discriminatory in a, in a negative sense. Um, and it was directed at um, importing labour from outside of Australia, um, particularly um, for cane cutting and pearl fishing, um, often people from the, the South Pacific. And the idea was that you would have some sort of indentured labourers, you, you have laws to contain where they live, what they can do, um, the, the sorts of occupations they can have, and then laws that then deport them, make them leave the country after we've used up their, um, the, their prime working life, um, which is pretty terrible stuff. But anyway, um, those laws were intended to be um, deliberately to be racially discriminatory. Now, they originally, that provision excluded Aboriginal people because it was intended to deal with people from other races from outside Australia coming into Australia. And it's that provision that was changed in 1967 to take out that exclusion so that it meant that the Commonwealth Parliament could make laws specifically with respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, and in doing so, making those laws, they could be 
discriminatory in an adverse way or they could be discriminatory in a beneficial way. Um, the, the provision in the constitution doesn't say, so it can work either way. Well, on that point, I'm curious to know what your view of the impact of the Cartinary case is. Yeah, um, so unfortunately that particular case um, didn't give a clear answer. So it's one of those awful cases where you've got, um, I think it was something like three judges said one thing, um, uh, two didn't say, and, um, and the numbers aren't adding up here, and it, one certainly went one way, three went another way, and then there were others who didn't say. Anyway, um, so the majority there is a bit of a mess, um, and, and in one or two cases it depends on how you interpret it. Um, but the gist of it seems to be, well, put it this way, at least there is nothing clear from that case that says that the Commonwealth Parliament can only legislate beneficially in relation to Indigenous people. I mean, an argument was put um, uh, and there was not a majority in favour of it. Um, equally, there wasn't a clear majority against it because the, um, the different judgments were a bit messy. Um, so the outcome of it wasn't clear, but on that basis, it still seems to be the case that the race power can be used in a way that uh, has an adverse discriminatory aspect to it. I think for people who aren't familiar with that case, um, could you just sum up what the substantial question of the Cartinary case was, please? Sure. Um, so the Cartinary case was about um, High Marsh Island Bridge Got it. and about whether or not the Commonwealth could legislate uh, in such a way that prevented further litigation about whether or not um, a, a particular area where the bridge was being built was um, or should have been protected as a sacred site. And so the argument is, was, well, could you use that race power to detract from um, existing laws that um, protect um, Aboriginal and sacred sites by saying, well, this law can't apply in this particular place where we're building a bridge. So the, the, the fundamental issue that was argued was that um, when that change was made to the constitution in 1967, it impliedly meant that the Commonwealth could only legislate in a way that was beneficial, that was for the benefit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, and um, in the end, there wasn't a clear majority um, because some of the judges simply said, well, if you've got the power to make a law, then that power also includes the ability to amend or repeal that law without us having to go further into that particular issue. Um, uh, one judge, however, I think it was Justice Kirby, said that you, um, um, that you can only use it in a beneficial way. And then a number of other judges said, well, no, the, the change in the constitution just didn't say that, didn't say one way or another. Uh, so the outcome was a little bit messy. But am I right in saying um, that even though the judgment in the Cartinary case was messy, um, in that we don't have a clear majority, that the government nevertheless interpreted it as saying unequivocally that the government the Commonwealth Government could legislate uh, in a way that was detrimental to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Yeah, look, I think it's fair to say that it's been interpreted on the basis that the High Court hasn't ever, by majority, said that you can only do it beneficially, and because of that, you can do it in a detrimental way until such time as a court would say otherwise. So it certainly leaves open at the moment the ability of the parliament to legislate in a manner that's detrimental to Indigenous people by using the race power, um, and we've got no authority that says otherwise. So from that point of view, yeah. And so when you assisted uh, Noel Pearson and Shireen Morris uh, to design The Voice, uh, was it the intention to uh, design The Voice uh, to uh, have an ameliorate, ameliorating effect on the capacity of uh, the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate for the detriment of Aboriginal people, in other words, in a racist way? 
Um, well, really, when we were approaching that, so th there's a context to this, and that is there had been a previous expert panel that was set up at the time of the um, the Gillard government, and it had recommended um, putting into the constitution an anti-racial discrimination provision, and the effect of that would have been that um, when you were dealing with Commonwealth legislation, if you did think it was discriminatory, then Indigenous people would have to trot off to court and send out your lawyers and go and fight and say, well, this is discriminatory and therefore knock the law down. Now, that proposal didn't get um, significant support from the government and indeed the opposition were extremely opposed to it. Um, various people said it was a one-line Bill of Rights, etc., and it wasn't getting much traction. So Noel came to say, well, is there another way we can approach the same issue, but by doing it in a way that sort of flips things? So instead of running off to court and having litigation about whether or not something is discriminatory, let's go to the bit before any of that happens and actually have Indigenous people being able to influence no more than influence, but influence government and parliament before the law is made. Now, the attraction of this was that, um, first of all, it gives Indigenous people much more agency because otherwise what we were, we were talking about was, you know, Indigenous people just send off their lawyers and you have these long and costly fights in the courts. Um, it might well be that you lose, in which case you've got a real problem with costs, so it's really expensive. Um, it takes a long amount of time for these things to be involved and it's quite risky. The reverse was what, what we were proposing here and that was, well, if you get Indigenous people involved at the beginning and they are the ones that are involved, so there's much more agency here, they're not sending out their lawyers, they're actually involved, there's no risk of costs, you're doing it before the policy or the law is, is enacted. If you can get that kind of influence at that point, maybe you can get the same outcome, but you can do it without that horrible, long, messy legal process. You get that outcome by exercising influence in advance. Another thing to say about the context of this was the political context, uh, because by the time this was happening, it was when a coalition government was in government and the view was can we um, propose something that would be acceptable to the conservative side of a coalition government and that's why Noel approached a number of people on the conservative side so there was Julian Lisa and Damien Freeman and Greg Craven and they invited me to come along and be the you know technical person it's a bit like one of those things like Ocean's Eleven when you bring in all your experts. Well, I was the, 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 the technical person um, uh, involved. And so the, the point of here was that there were two key things from a conservative point of view that they um, insisted on. And they said the two key things are, one, that we don't muck around with Parliament's power. So we don't impede the ability of Parliament to make laws. We don't slow down the lawmaking process. Parliament maintains its autonomy. So you can influence in advance, but you don't get to control. So that was thing number one. Thing number two was to try and do it in a way that didn't end up with a whole lot of litigation. Uh, because again, the conservative side, as we've seen, don't really like that. Um, and it does slow down the system and the like. So the idea was, can we develop something where Indigenous people get to come in in advance, influence, but not slow down or control or demand, but have just the ability and the capacity to come in and influence at a political level to try and make sure that the sorts of laws and policies that are made that are directed towards them are not only you know, non-discriminatory or, or not not detrimental to them, that are actually more effective, more efficient, giving better outcomes, um, better informing the government so that when it makes a policy or when the parliament makes a law, it actually makes a good one that will be effective and useful and, and you know, value for money and all those sorts of things that we know don't happen at the moment. Um, and so that that was the original intent behind it. 
So it must irk you then to uh, hear people say that uh, the proposal in the referendum question is risky and, oh, yeah. and, and, and you know, will lead to endless litigation. Um, what's your view on those claims? Uh, Marsha, I am beyond irked, can I say? <laughs> I, I am so irked. Um, uh, yeah, uh, look, it, it really is annoying because the whole thing was very deliberately built on the basis that none of that would happen. That was the point of the exercise. Um, and yet people decide that they want to pretend it's going to happen anyway because that way they can defeat it. Um, it's just um, extraordinarily annoying. Um, so one of the things that I do try and explain to people a lot, because I don't think people really get it, is that the way this um, proposal was um, designed was very deliberately to keep it out of the realm of law and put it into the realm of politics. So the idea is not that you go out and you have lawyers fighting at 10 paces in the high court sort of constantly about thing. The idea was that you don't go around sort of, you know, gumming up the, the government and slowing things down with litigation. Um, it was in fact the complete reverse and that the constraints that were built into the system were always intended to be political constraints. So let me give you an example of that. One of the things that tends to agitate people is that they say, well, the scope of the representations that can be made, that's that's far too wide. Um, it says that you can make representations on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And they say, oh, you should narrow that down. It should say like matters directly relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And I think, oh no. The whole point of it was was not to do that. And what do I mean there is, well, if you put matters directly relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, then guess what? We all go trotting down to court and say, well, where do you draw the line? Is this directly relating or is that directly or not directly relating? And let's just have massive fights about it. That would be stupid. And that's why the words are deliberately broad so that that point doesn't come up before a court so that, yeah, representations can be made on virtually anything and there's no point fighting about it in court because what's supposed to constrain it is the politics, okay? And this is how the whole system is supposed to work. So what's the politics involved here? Um, well, one of the, the, the key things in the politics is that if Indigenous people are the ones who choose their members on The Voice, and the voice goes off making representations and a whole lot of irrelevant or silly things, then Indigenous people are going to be mighty cross and kick off those people because there are actually a lot of really important issues that the voice is going to need to deal with. And if they're wasting and squandering their time and resources on stupid things, then the people who are their constituency, the ones who either elect or appoint them, are going to chuck them off. Hmm. Um, uh, there will also be the fact that Parliament can legislate to change the way that the voice operates and how it's constructed and who gets to be chosen on it, et cetera, et cetera, which will happen if the voice goes around and squanders its, um, um, its ability to achieve anything. So the, the point of the exercise was to use political pressure to contain and focus what the voice does instead of using legal constraints by sticking in words like, you know, um, directly relating to or anything like that that's going to end up in litigation. And so it's just extraordinarily annoying that the very people who say, oh, no, we don't want loads of litigation and we don't want things clogged down in the courts are precisely the same people who say, oh, look, you've got to stick in extra words there that say things like directly relating to and narrow it down so legally its scope is limited. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. I mean, the, one of the biggest annoyances in this, this whole debate is that the very people who raise particular concerns where the concern itself has no basis are suggesting ways of dealing with it in a way that actually would make it a matter of concern. Mm. Yes, uh, we've all seen that. Uh, the very interesting points that you make, which leads me to the 
key question now, the proposal uh, that people will vote on makes it very clear in the, um, the new chapter, which people will read in their ballot papers, that the parliament will decide the composition, powers and functions of the voice. So I imagine given the uh, annoying debates we've had to contend with from people who basically don't know what they're talking about, uh, that, that actually writing the legislation in Parliament, should we succeed at the referendum, will be quite a, uh, quite a process. Yep, I think it will. Um, so look, there are a number of things that come up there because, you know, people raise this all the time and say, well, why can't you give us the details in advance? Um, uh, and, you know, seem to think that there's some kind of magic version in someone's back pocket that they're hiding. Um, and look, the reality is, first of all, there's going to be need to be significant consultation with Indigenous people, because if you're going to have a voice for the purposes of representing Indigenous people across the whole country, well, then, you know, it would be completely the opposite of the entire purpose of the exercise if Parliament or the government just came and said, right, you're going to be represented in this way, like we tell you, and you don't have any choice. Okay, so the first thing is that there's going to have to be massive consultation across the country with Indigenous Australians to work out how different communities genuinely feel they will be represented on the voice hmm. so there's that process and then the the second process involved is the well what are all the other details you know and there's all sorts of things you know anytime you establish any kind of organization you've got to work out things like you know what are the qualifications or disqualifications for people sort of coming on to it how long a term will they have how are they chosen how are they removed you know um, uh, you know, how does this body interact with government? Are we going to set up protocols to do some kind of advanced consultation, noting there's no legal obligation to consult, but it might be from a political point of view, you want to consult on particular things. All of that sort of stuff is going to have to be worked out. Some of it can be worked out by just sort of government policy, um, but a lot of it's going to have to be worked out in Parliament. Um, the Prime Minister has said that he wants to have some kind of a bipartisan committee doing that. Um, so, you know, one would hope that if we get to a point where the referendum is successful and you have the political pressure of a vote of the Australian people saying we want this done, we want it sorted out, that might push politicians to be a bit more sensible and cooperative because they know that it has the will of the people behind it. Uh, but, you know, it's likely to be a difficult exercise. Um, I guess the other thing, by the way, that irks me, going back to irksomeness, um, is the fact that you'll often see politicians popping up and saying, well, you know, no one's said or told me the detail of like, how are we going to decide, you know, how many of the people are on the voice and how they're chosen or whatever. And I'm thinking, you. You, yeah. the politician, the person who's saying is, you're the person who's going to be in the room. You're the person voting in Parliament. You're the person who gets to decide all of this. How can you go off from around the place saying that, you know, nobody knows how this is going to be done? Well, we do know how it's going to be done. It says so in the amendment. It says it's going to be done by Parliament. And that means you. Um, and um, how on earth they don't understand that is a bit beyond me. That is a nice touch to the misdirect, isn't it? By feigning an ignorance of your own job in Parliament. <laughs> well, it's just completely bemusing. I it mean, is, I, isn't I, it? I really don't understand. <laughs> well, I think I think people are just, you know, expecting that we won't pick them up on it. Maybe I'm not sure. Who knows? But it is very bemusing. Yeah. Uh, so this is not a vanity question, but I have the opportunity to ask you, and I may never have this opportunity again, I assume that you've read the so-called Calma Langton report, the voice co-design final report, uh, and if you have, what is your view of that as a model for what the parliament uh, would consider, say through its uh, joint parliamentary committee, um, following a successful referendum? 
Um, I think it's a really solid start. So you do need somewhere to start um, and having someone who's properly thought through the issues and raise the evidence gives you that groundwork. Um, but, you know, it may well be that the government has, you know, slightly different views or things have moved on a bit since then, or maybe you need to compromise here or there with um, on um, particular matters to get bipartisan support. So as with all things, um, it's, it's going to be the building blocks, the foundations, um, but it needs to leave open the ability for, you know, politically for people to build on that. So, yeah, a really good start. And if we didn't have that, heaven knows where we would begin. Um, but it, having that as, as the background to start from and build from, I think, will be really useful. So uh, that report, that voice co-design final report and, and its interim report, uh, along with the uh, the constitutional recognition aspect of the question were both recommended by the Joint Select Committee chaired by Julian Lisa and Senator Patrick Dodson. And there were four recommendations in their 2018 Joint Select Committee report. And that was the process that the Morrison government followed. Uh, the present opposition leader, Peter Dutton, was in Cabinet uh, and must have agreed to follow the process recommended by the Joint Select Committee um, and, indeed, the, um, it, the, the present opposition leader would have been in Cabinet and seen each of the very detailed reports presented to Cabinet on the basis of the processes that followed those recommendations. That's right. And the funny thing is that I think people forget that the, that report was actually prepared for a coalition government. Yeah. Uh, and it was also prepared in the context where they were saying they weren't going to do constitutional recognition. So the constitutional aspect was out and it was intended to be a legislative proposal. So it was prepared in a in a different context, uh, but it's, it's not something that you can now turn around for from and say, well, you know, this is all uh, some kind of a Labor proposal because it, it, it was indeed um, a report prepared for a coalition government and a coalition government was intending to head towards um, giving legislative effect to this. And, you know, I don't think it's ever really properly explained to people um, why that kind of a voice um, which um, still does the same thing of giving advice or giving making representations or whatever you want to call it to government and parliament before laws are enacted, why that would be okay, but the um, version in the Constitution wouldn't. I mean, you know, um, just saying it's in the Constitution, therefore it's bad, isn't actually an answer to that. Um, effectively, you've got both sides of um, Parliament, both the Coalition and Labor, support the same things. They support Indigenous people having a voice um, to Parliament and the Executive, um, and also they support changing the Constitution to recognise Indigenous people. Um, but, you know, sometimes the arguments that are then subsequently given in relation to this referendum seem to be a bit contradictory um, to those particular propositions where there actually is universal support. So why... I'm, I'm actually genuinely confused now. So, so why is that universal support and the bipartisanship on Indigenous matters over the past few decades seem now to have fallen apart then? What, what is driving that? Uh, well, um, this then comes down to politics. Um, so if you look at the history of referendums, um, oppositions frequently choose to oppose um, simply because they think that opposition gives them a political benefit. Um, so, for example, if you look back at the 1988 referendum, um, you know, at least one or more of the questions were things that the coalition had themselves previously put to a referendum. It wasn't anything contrary to what they supported, 
but they took a, a political view that it was in their advantage to oppose everything, to oppose all four of them, um, uh, simply because that would, you know, give a kick to the government. And so that's really what they did back in 1988. Um, so ultimately, a lot of this all turns on politi politics, you know, leadership, a whole lot of other things. But, um, you know, the, the underlying policy issues um, mm. are actually the differences of paper thin. Mm. Politics for the sake of politics. Um, do, you, do you think this strategy is actually going to work for the LNP and the no campaign? Do you, do you think if a no vote, and we're crystal ball gazing here obviously and it is speculation, so let's declare that, but do you think this will actually work in um, providing political advantage going to the next election to the opponents? Um, well, look, this is heading outside my constitutional area of expertise. Um, so I'm not a political scientist. Um, uh, the only observation I'd make is if the if the coalitions if the coalition needs to win back the teal cases teal seats in order to win government, uh, then this is probably not the best way of doing it. Um, so that's going to lead them to some difficulties in that regard. They're, they're going to need to be sort of finding seats from elsewhere if, if, if that's their approach, um, seems to me. But as I say, not my area of, of expertise. Constitutional stuff is um, more in my realm. Hmm. So, and um, a number of former High Court judges and former Chief Justices of uh, the State Courts are... Uh, I think uh, at least 11, perhaps 14 or 15 in all, have declared the proposition that Australians will vote on on October 14 to be legally sound, constitutionally sound and safe. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Uh, well, I agree with them. <laughs> um, so, yes, I, I went and saw a talk by... Um, uh, Tom Bathurst and Jim Spiegelman, both um, former Chief Justices of New South Wales the other night, um, and they were absolutely relaxed and fine about this particular amendment. Um, we've heard many other judges say the same, and I've actually spoken behind the scenes to former High Court judges who haven't been out in, in public, um, but who have um, said that they can't for the life of them understand what all the kerfuffle's about. Um, so, yeah, uh, people who are generally familiar with the Constitution, um, for the most part, are not in the slightest bit concerned about the, the, the various um, over-the-top types of um, arguments that are being made. And moreover, uh, more than one of them has said that it's not just safe and sound and robust, but it's also practical. Do you agree with that? Well, it's certainly intended to be practical. I mean, that was the whole point of it. Uh, so, you know, going back to that issue of constitutional recognition, um, remembering that um, a lot of people say, oh, well, I'd be happy to vote for constitutional recognition, but, you know, I don't like this voice thing. And I think they don't really understand that the voice is the constitutional recognition. Hmm. So one of the things that attracted me to this particular proposal was that the recognition comes from the actual act of listening to Indigenous people and it's a living and ongoing recognition. It's not just sticking some words in a preamble or somewhere that no one ever reads. Um, one of the things that people don't really understand or know is that um, every single state constitution recognises Indigenous Australians, either in a preamble or in a substantive section. And there's two reasons nobody knows about it. Um, the first is that you didn't need a referendum to put it in there, so nobody voted for it. Uh, but the second, re well, parliaments voted for it, but the people didn't. Um, but the second reason is that those um, statements don't actually achieve anything. They don't do anything. They're just words on a page. Um, and so they're ignored and they don't really have an effect. Whereas uh, this particular proposal for a voice would have a practical effect. So you've got recognition that happens, not just sitting on a page in the Constitution, but you've got recognition that happens every single time the voice makes a representation and is being listened to because we recognise people by paying them the respect 
of listening to their views. It doesn't mean that we have to comply with their views or that their views are demands that must be um, uh, complied with. It doesn't mean that at all, but it just means that we pay people respect by listening to their views. And that's what this proposed amendment would do. And that then carries on into the practical level. Because when governments do listen to those views, governments and parliaments may become better informed, make better decisions, uh, make decisions that have genuine and important effects on the ground in people's lives and hopefully result in better outcomes. So you've got that marvellous um, joining there of the recognition and the practical in the one thing. And again, if you go back to the politics of this and you, you, you listen to what everybody said on all sides, everybody will say they want the constitutional recognition, the symbolic stuff, but they want it to be practical as well. They want practical outcomes from Indigenous people. And you can find hundreds of places where that's said by you know, various ministers or shadow ministers in the, in, uh, on the coalition side. So everybody agrees that we want something practical. Everybody agrees that we want that constitutional recognition. And yet we're still having this fight about the referendum amendment, which is quite extraordinary, really. It certainly is. I, I must admit, I didn't know about the state constitutions. Yeah, well, virtually nobody does, but, yeah. but it is there. Um, it, it was progressively made um, over a period of, I don't know, 10 years or so, each one of the, the states um, put a provision in its constitution. But, um, you know, having words on a page, it might be nice for constitutional geeks like me to be able to see it, but most people in the real world um, uh, don't see it and it doesn't have any practical effect unless you have something in there that um, flows through to real life. And that's why this particular voice amendment is so much better. So what would you say to people then who are levelling a similar claim that if voted up, the voice won't have any practical effect at the federal level either? Uh, well, I think, again, it comes back to the politics. So I'd like to split again that idea of politics and law. There's no legal obligation on the government to do prior consultation or to accept what the voice is, et cetera, et cetera. And so people will often then respond and say, well, what's the point? Why bother? It won't achieve anything. Well, that's rubbish because it will achieve things. And there is a point, And that's because of the political pressure. So the political pressure comes, first of all, from the Australian people because they have their voice, which is part of popular sovereignty, which is voting in the referendum and if the Australian people through their voice in a referendum say to the government loudly we want you to fix this we want you to take action to improve the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Islander people um, these are our brothers and sisters we recognize that they have been treated extraordinarily badly and that things do need to improve. And this is our will as the voters. Now, if that's said in a referendum, that's the most powerful thing that the Australian people can do. And politicians will respond to that. So if politicians do get representations from the voice that say, look, there's a problem here. This is how this particular law is operating in these particular communities. Here is evidence of what is going on there, and this is why there's a problem. Here's our suggestion as to how you might improve things. You can tweak this law in a particular way, still achieve the, the ideals that you have with that law, the things that you're trying to achieve, but without the bad effect. And you can do it, say, more efficiently and in a cheaper way. Now, if the voice makes those kinds of representations to government, it's a complete no brainer. Of course, government is then going to say, right, well, actually, we've now looked at this and you're right. Yes, we can do this in a way that has a better outcome and still achieves the things that we were trying to achieve, but didn't have this indirect effect that we never really thought about. 
um, and achieve it in a better way. So, of course, we're going to do it. So it will depend, of course, on the advice that the voice gives. If the voice gives sensible advice, if it's um, um, cognizant of the various other kinds of political pressures on the government, um, so if it gives advice that helps the government save money, for example, um, if it gives advice that, you know, won't have a bad impact on everybody else, for example, it needs to take all those things into account. But if it does its job, properly, then it will give advice through representations to government and parliament that will be acted on, not because of a legal obligation, but because it's a sensible thing for governments to do. Um, and, you know, that's what the whole thing's there for, really. I like that concept that you raised of um, popular sovereignty as well. It's the first time I've heard that particular phraseology, but... It sort of ca captures the essence of what we're being asked to do here, isn't it? This is pretty much a direct vote for a direct outcome, isn't it? We actually have the power to affect change here. Yeah. So this is what the High Court has said. So, you know, there's a whole, as you know, massive debate about sovereignty and um, British settlement and all the rest of it. But leaving that behind a bit, what the High Court has said is the British Crown no longer has sovereignty in relation to Australia, all right? And so the reason for that is that we've cut off all our links to Britain, except for the fact that we still have a king. But other than that, we cut them all off. And now everything's in Australian hands. And so when the High Court was asked, you know, it was raised in a number of cases from the, about the 1990s onwards, uh, where does sovereignty lie now in Australia? The High Court says... Sovereignty lies in the Australian people, popular sovereignty. And that includes Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people. It's all of the Australian people. And it says so because precisely of this, this thing about voting in a referendum, because they said, ultimately, who controls the Constitution? Who controls the Constitution is the Australian people, partly through their election of representatives to Parliament, because to get a referendum to the Australian people, it's still got to be passed through Parliament. But ultimate control is held in the hands of the Australian people because we're the ones who, without pencils, when we go in and we vote in a referendum, we're the ones who control what's in the Constitution by saying yes or no as to whether or not it gets changed. So that's the concept that the High Court has, has put forward for popular sovereignty in Australia. And it is our act of popular sovereignty when we go in and we vote in a referendum. That makes the responsibility very clear, doesn't it? Well, it is a really important responsibility. And I guess the one thing that, as, as a constitutional lawyer, the one thing, well, one of the many things I worry about is that if we fall for an argument of don't know, vote no, that argument is insidious because what it's telling us is not only that we're too lazy and can't be bothered, you know, to, to vote in an informed way and shouldn't bother, but it's telling us something worse than that. It's basically encouraging us to give up our sovereignty. Mm. It's saying, don't bother actually giving an informed vote, okay? Just just, just leave it go and, and, and vote no automatically so that what happens in the future, what happens next time, if, if the view is taken as a consequence of this vote, that the no vote meant that Australians are effectively always going to vote no and it's not going to be possible ever to get change, then what's going to happen in the future? I mean, the answer is referendums are just not going to be put to the people. The people are going to hand over their sovereignty and say, so, well, we can't be stuffed. We're not going to make an informed vote. We're just going to, you know, let it go. And the consequence is either the constitution ends up frozen and can't be changed, which is a danger in itself. I mean, people talk about legal risk. Can I tell you, there's a greater legal risk in having an unamendable constitution that ends up not being able to deal with the needs of the time. Or what happens? is that the constitution ends up being changed through interpretation by the High Court. And so here's the massive irony in all of this, 
He said, all those people going out there saying, don't no, vote no, because, hey, the evil high court's going to interpret this particular amendment in some kind of a bizarre way, and that's going to cause you grief, are actually encouraging people to give up their sovereignty and so that only the high court is able to change the constitution in a completely unaccountable way through interpretation. I don't think they've really thought through what they're arguing. I think they just argue this because they think it's a cheap win, you know, but, you know, from a point of view of long-term political effects, would any serious-minded politician actually tell the Australian people to not bother to give an informed vote, don't no vote no, and basically hand over their sovereignty and abandon it? I, I just cannot for the life of me understand why any serious politician who had thought about what they were doing would ever say that. I mean, I certainly wouldn't ever, regardless of whether I supported a referendum or not. I think it's a terrible thing, a terrible, terrible message to send the Australian people. Um, if you don't know, you should find out and give an informed vote, whether that vote's yes or whether that vote's no. If you vote no, it needs to be an informed no because we need the Australian people to make a genuine choice in a referendum and fully exercise their sovereignty. If the answer is simply default, we don't know and we can't be stuffed, then that really is a serious problem for Australia's democracy in the future. I can't think of any better way to end this podcast, Anne, uh, but I do want to say to you that I think the question is, uh, like Occam's razor, simple and elegant, and it's a very fine solution to a long-standing problem, and I want to thank you very much for your contribution. Thanks, Marsha. I'm still kind of stunned, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't even really fathom that. Yeah, I think we're all nonplussed, and we are all nonplussed. Those of us who understand why you have gone about problem solving in the way that you have with Noel and Shireen and many others. And we thank you for it. Yes. Well, all you can do is try. I mean, look, I guess one other thing, and I don't know whether you need this for your podcast at all, but the one thing I would say is that even if the referendum fails, it's important to have tried. Yeah. Um, it's important that we don't just sit on our backsides and do nothing because it's all too hard. Change takes a long time. If you look at the arc of history, change to give women the right to vote, for example, took an awful long time. Change to give Indigenous people the right to vote took an awful long time. There were failures along the way. Uh, but, you know, you still need people to stand up and take action and do things and try even if the result is failure it's a step along the way and i don't think we should be overwhelmed um, with discouragement about it i think we've got to put it in perspective and say even if the referendum fails at least people tried put things on the agenda and we will move forward and there will be other steps in the future yeah wise words thank you <laughs>